the summer of 1962, 26 high-yield airdrops, proof tests of new and existing weapon designs, were conducted by the United States. In this, the last of the above-ground nuclear tests, the Atomic Energy Commission also tested advanced concepts for an anti-ballistic missile defense. Starfish Prime was one of five high-altitude ABM tests. And in that event, we learned something about the effects on our satellites. We learned about the effects on aircraft that we had uh, operating at the time, and, and even at the events on Hawaii. Nearly a thousand miles away, the high-altitude electromagnetic pulse from Starfish Prime disrupted Hawaii's power grid and its telecommunications. The Starfish test gave us a much better appreciation for the extent to which EMP environments could propagate. The effects outside of the Earth's atmosphere were especially significant. The communication relay circuitry of Telstar 1, the prize of the satellite community, was an inadvertent casualty of the 1.4 megaton test. Fire. The effects of Starfish Prime also underscored known vulnerabilities of U.S. ballistic missile systems. By 1962, efforts were underway to ensure the never of nuclear weapons with PALs and safety retrofits, ensuring the always, the nuclear weapon effects survivability of warheads, now commanded equal attention. The earliest reentry systems had not been sufficiently hardened against nuclear environments. So hardness was one of the big deals of Miniman too. We wanted the missile to be rad hard, starting from the reentry vehicle down through the propulsion, including all the guidance electronics. Uh, rad hard, big deal. We spent a lot of money on that. May Day celebration in Moscow's Red Square, and the traditional parade features military equipment. When Galosh was revealed, it came as a shock because we, by that time, realized we'd made fundamental error in, in the assumptions for the possibility of a ballistic missile defense on the part of the Soviets. Uh, when we got the technical intelligence that said that the Soviets uh, had proceeded down a different path altogether, uh, we were forced to deal with, with uh, exoatmospheric effects. The galosh really uh put the stake in the ground for uh, pursuing hardness for all weapons in the future. The predominant vulnerability from a, from a weapon survivability perspective uh, varies depending upon whether you're looking at it exoatmospherically or endoatmospherically. Outside the atmosphere, X-rays will travel great distances because they're unattenuated by the vacuum of space. Be it the aeroshell, or the nuclear package, or the arming, fusing, and firing system. All portions of a reentry body are potentially vulnerable. In particular, the electronics had to be treated in such a way that, that it could survive rather heavy nuclear doses. And that meant not only making designs, but testing them. Underground testing in tunnels deep beneath the surface provides information about nuclear effects that cannot be obtained in any other way. Here in steel pipes as much as one quarter of a mile long, specially tailored experiments yield up information that is vital to the design of new weapon systems. Quick closing shutters stop the debris from blowing down the pipe and wrecking the experiments but permit X-rays and particles to reach their targets. As the Atomic Energy Commission began to address nuclear weapon effects survivability, the Department of Defense considered the strategic impact of a broad-based Soviet ballistic missile defense. We assumed that they wouldn't just defend Moscow, they would extend it across all of, all of Russia, all of the Soviet Union. And we had to think about how would we respond to that. How do we insulate ourselves against an expansion of the defense? 
an active nuclear tip defense. What do we do on the offensive side to assure penetration? There are two different, generically different ways of going about it. One of them was to penetrate by using penetration aids, which in effect denies the information needed to uh, discriminate the reentry bodies from uh, decoys. And that was the approach that was taken largely by the Air Force. And we'd done all kinds of experiments on decoys, uh, balloons, uh, chaff, you name it. Always come to the conclusion finally that, look, uh, by the time you get down through the atmosphere, these things don't work very well. This year, more fleet ballistic missile submarines increase our nuclear deterrent powers on the seven seas. Each is ready to fire Polaris missiles from hidden launching platforms. We spent a lot of time and energy on penetration aids, particularly with Polaris, uh, the so-called A3T, which had substantial penetration aid capability. But it also meant that we concluded that the best penetration aid is another warhead, and that led to Poseidon. A second approach to the problem of survivability was one advocated by Vice Admiral Levering Smith, the longtime director of the Navy's Special Projects Office. The quote of Levering Smith is that we'll make decoys, only we'll put a bomb in each one of them. In other words, the Poseidon was a vast expansion of the number of reentry bodies carried per missile. And basically, the idea was to overload the defense with so many reentry bodies that they were incapable of handling all of them at the same time. MERS that could substantially increase our offensive capability uh, was one way of doing it. In 1964, McNamara approved the development of multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles. MIRVs fulfilled a policy objective and offered the Navy new capabilities. You know, there's a real difference in uh, ballistic missile systems between Air Force systems and Navy systems. The real difference is uh, we, the Navy is very size, weight constrained. Small is important in the sense that because of the submarine limitations, uh, the Navy can't capriciously decide they want to have bigger missiles. Weight is always a concern to the Navy as it translates into throw range, which then converts into patrol area. In Poseidon, the desire was to get the smallest possible reentry body so we could put the largest number of them on the front end of this new Poseidon missile. And so it was a unique, an absolutely unique undertaking and one upon which the performance of the Navy systems absolutely depended. Looking like a stub-wing pursuit ship, the Regulus churns up the water as it is blasted off the cruiser Helena. Like the other services, the Navy actively pursued a nuclear capability early on. In 1955, the fleet ballistic missile was conceived of as a complete system put in place and maintained by the Navy's Special Projects Office. Polaris was on station by 1960. Guided first by Admiral Red Rayburn, the Navy's SPO would, through the practice of integration, deploy Poseidon in 1971. We could not afford carrying one extra pound of weight. We deliberately designed and wrote specifications for not the fusing system, not for a, an arming system or a warhead. We wrote our requirements for a reentry body, which was an integrated system. The notion of integration allows you to better manage packaging, mounting, and interfaces between two different assemblies. I believe integration bought for the Navy the ability to do the Mark III system. The traditional arming, fusing, and firing systems were sufficiently large 
that they had to be packaged in the back end of the reentry vehicle. As a result, a ballast had to be added in to offset the weight of this active hardware in the back of the body. If the arming, infusing, and firing system could be miniaturized and integrated such that it could be packaged in what was otherwise ballast space in the front, then you could save much more than pound for pound in the design of the reentry body. To do that, we needed uh, some new thinking about the, about the arming and the fusing. Sandia and Lawrence and Los Alamos were in fact building reentry vehicles that would support the feasibility of small multiples. Ironically, the semiconductors so essential to small multiples opened the door to increased radiation effects. Miniaturization both required and enabled the developer to consider a wider range of design options. Through integration, if I've been able to save weight, I can now think about utilizing some of that weight margin for features that would allow me to enhance the radiation hardness of the design. So it's a matter of, of choosing the right elemental components. It's a matter of the proper circuit design. It meant that the uh, nuclear materials, uh, making sure that if they got to very high temperature, it wouldn't distort. They wanted to carry as many as 14 reentry bodies. Weight was extremely important to their achieving that number of bodies for the range they wanted. So ounces counted. There was no free lunch in the, in the design of the, of the Mark III reentry body, its warhead, or its arming, fusing, and firing system. Sandia, together with its AEC partners, met the challenges and delivered a highly reliable, lightweight, radiation-hardened design fulfilling the Navy's objective of a survivable nuclear deterrent. The decision we made for the Mark III to use Sandia, it was something quite new. We didn't know how it was going to work out. It turned out to work out very well indeed. Probably the two key thrusts that were enablers for the future were miniaturization and hardness. Those two together allowed us to meet sort of evolving stockpile needs for much harder from a radiation perspective, smaller, lighter reentry systems for the stockpile. In May 1972, anti-ballistic missile system development was checked by a landmark arms control agreement. Even as Nixon and Brezhnev signed the ABM treaty, new threats were emerging to challenge the survivability of the U.S. strategic deterrent. Right after the Moscow summit, I was still director of central intelligence. Uh, there was a veritable explosion of research and development activities on the part of the Russians. The number of tests of Soviet missiles just expanded exponentially. The ICBMs, or the strategic offensive missiles that are deployed in the 1970s carry multiple warheads and they are more accurate and therefore they do pose a greater threat to hardened targets in the U.S. In 1972, the Soviets deployed their first Delta-class ballistic missile submarine with a missile range of more than 4,000 miles. late 60s, we became increasingly concerned about uh, potential anti-submarine warfare capabilities of the Soviets. It was believed by many that it was only a matter of time until a counter to the submarine was found. The oceans were going to be made transparent. And that led to a whole bunch of discussions and debates about survivability. For the Navy, survivability meant both penetrating Soviet defenses as well as shielding its sea-based platforms from detection. To enhance what the Navy called its pre-launch survivability, the Poseidon submarines could no longer cruise close to shore. 
from a survivability of the launch platform. Uh, the larger the area you patrol in, the harder it is to detect where you're located. So going from the C-3 Poseidon to the C-4 Trident, we gained tremendous increase in sea room. And also in order to keep the missile as effective at the greater range, we had to have some improvement.